Fantastic. Even Abigail did good today. I heard that comment about me having to wear a mask. I got an elephant's memory. I know what she said. Well, good morning, church. It's good to see all your faces, most of your pretty faces. For those of you who are watching online, I'm so glad you're with us today. You know, God is working. Even in the midst of a pandemic, he is still working. There's people that are coming to our church who are new through our online platforms. And so there's one thing I want to say to you. This is, this is truth. This is a fact that God is in control. And he reigns supreme. And nothing, and I mean nothing, can separate us from the love of Jesus Christ. No pandemic, no illness, no death, nothing can separate us from him. So I am really excited about today's message. I'm excited about bringing this message to you. I've been, been working on this message, and uh, it's been convicting to me. I know we're in this very important uh, season of our lives as a church and as individuals. You know, this pandemic has been going on now for over six months, and it has disrupted all of our lives in various ways, including the church. You know, at the beginning of the year, we rolled out our vision of where God is leading us as a church. And our mission statement is four words. It's Christ revealed, people restored. The more that Christ is revealed in your life, the more that you become restored. To say it a different way is the more that Christ increases in you and the more that you decrease, you unlock the power of the Holy Spirit. The power that, gives, the power that he gives is the power to love unconditionally, to have a peace that transcends all understanding, to show mercy, to show grace. That power is in us. And we're back now on our seasonal approach. I know the pandemic kind of threw a little monkey wrench in what we were trying to do, and our last season got kind of put to the side, but we are now back into our seasonal approach. It's Christ in our feet season. And what that means is that the, the, the marker, the objective of this season is listen and then jump. And what that means is learning to listen to the Holy Spirit and then following the promptings of the Holy Spirit. And we're in this very, very important critical sermon series called Still Waters. And the purpose of this series is learning to quiet ourselves down, learning to be still. Because when we become still, we position ourselves to allow the Holy Spirit to do his work in us. It helps us to listen, to hear the work of the Holy Spirit in us. In the past three weeks, you've heard from Wes, and you heard from Randy two weeks ago, and last week you heard from our student pastor, Andrew Franzen. I gotta tell you, he did a fantastic job uh, last week. He is young, but he is, he is wise beyond his years. And I tell you, if you have a middle school or high school student, they are in great hands with Andrew Franzen and company back there, so bravo to him. But we've been talking about how to steal yourself, how to quiet yourself, like I said, when we do that, when we find a place to be quiet, we push out the noise of the world. We, we push away the distractions, the troubles that we're faced with. Friends, I gotta tell you, the world doesn't care about your spiritual lives. The world doesn't care about your faith. The world is not a friend when it comes to your spiritual lives, and there's so much noise and distraction and negativity and, and finger pointing and blaming going on. And it's hard to still ourselves in the midst of all of that. I find it hard for myself to be still, to be pulled from the things that I hear on social media and the news. But it's so important that we still ourselves. Because when we do that, we start to learn to have confidence in who God says he is. We start to have a peace that transcends all understanding. Who doesn't want peace, especially now? To not be troubled on the inside when trouble comes. You know, I gotta tell you, we are in a, the sermon series, Still Waters. Today I wanna use this verse um, out of Exodus 14, 14. And when we become still, when we position ourselves, we quiet ourselves, allow the spirit to do his work, we unlock a lot of promises that God has for us. 
And one of those promises comes out of Exodus 14, 14. This is one of my favorite verses of scripture. It's a power scripture. I write this down. I put this in my house. I love this verse. And when we can be still and allow God to be God and let God do what God does, this is the promise that he gives us in Exodus 14, 14. He says, the Lord will fight for you. You only need to be still. What a great promise. What a great reminder. The Lord will fight for you. You only need to be still. The creator of the universe, the God of all above, the the prince of peace, the king of kings, the Lord of lords was fighting for you. You only need to be still. Now I have to confess something to you. I have to admit that I am a fan of movies where a guy gets harmed or a girl gets harmed and then they come back and they have some revenge. There's some vindication going on. So they've been done wrong and then they come back and they're victorious. I love those kind of movies. One of my favorite movies of all time is Gladiator. You guys have seen Gladiator with Russell Crowe? It's such a great movie and, and, and Russell Crowe is Maximus in this movie. He's this commander of this Roman empire or this army. And the, the emperor, he, he's about ready to die and he wasn't gonna give it over to his son, but his son ended up killing him. And his son becomes emperor and wants Maximus to be the commander now. And Maximus says no. And so the new emperor is mad. He, he sends people out to kill his family. He enslaves uh, Maximus and tries to kill him, but he escapes, runs to his family. He's too late, his family was killed. Then he becomes captive, he's a slave, then he becomes a gladiator. At the end, he faces the emperor in a battle of one-on-one and he wins. And I love the fact that he got to get revenge. I love that he came back at the end and, and vindicated himself. I love the first four Rocky Balboas. After four, they just go downhill pretty quick. Rocky three had, you know, Hawk Hogan thunder lips in it. And Rocky four, I love Rocky IV. Apollo Creed comes out of retirement and he fights the Russian, Ivan Drago. Ivan Drago kills him in the ring and he says, if he dies, he must die. That's a terrible Russian accent. I'm terrible with accents. And then Stallone or Balboa comes out of retirement and he's training and he ends up beating Ivan Drago in his home country. I love that stuff. I love how people can kind of of get back and get some revenge and be vindicated. If we're gonna be honest, when when trouble comes, when when someone does us wrong, when someone harms our family, when, when, when trouble comes in our lives, we want to take the fight into our own hands. It's natural for us to want to take control of the fight. And the scripture reminds us it's not our fight to be fighting. God said, I want to fight for you. You just need to be still. It doesn't come natural to let go of that. It sounds great in theory. Yes, God will fight for me. I just need to be still. But to play it out in life, let's be honest, that's really hard to do because everything in you says, no, 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 I'm going to get some revenge. I'm going to get you back. I think someone needs to hear this today. God wants his fight back. God wants his fight back. You're fighting a battle that you weren't meant to fight. God wants his fight back. He wants the battle back. Just need to be still. You know, this thing called life, it is a battleground. And when we are in a battle, trouble comes with that battle. And we are faced with trouble all around us. Look on the news for 10 minutes and you'll see the trouble that's around us. Maybe for some of you, you've, you've had some unfavorable news when it comes to your health. Maybe your kids have gone astray. Maybe you've lost a job. Trouble is all around. Matter of fact, Jesus promises we're going to have some of that kind of trouble. And we have to be careful when trouble comes that it doesn't send us into a tailspin, that it disrupts our inside. And the last discourse of Jesus is the upper room scene. It's the Last Supper. And it's called the last discourse. He begins and he ends the discourse with trouble. 
In John 14, 1, he says, do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in me, or you believe in God, believe also in me. And I'm gonna get to believe here in just a second. And then at the very end of the discourse, in John 16, he says, in this world, you're gonna have some trouble. You're gonna have some trouble, but take heart. He's saying, be still. I have overcome the world. This is another way of saying that God is fighting for us. Be still. I have overcome the world. Now the Greek word for trouble, it is a severe word. It is a word for deep pain and hurt and discouragements and suffering. Jesus uses this word in John chapter 13, right before this. He himself becomes troubled. He is troubled by the fact that Judas Iscariot is about ready to betray him. But then he says in John 14, do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not let what's on the outside invade what's on the inside. And this word is significant. Here's what Jesus is saying Don't let your hearts be kept up all night, overwhelmed about an uncertain future. Don't let your heart be torn to pieces because someone you loved betrayed you. Don't allow your hearts to be ripped open because you received a devastating phone call in the middle of the night. Don't let your hearts be stomped on when you hear you have a terminal illness. Don't let your hearts be run over and backed up over again and run over and backed up over and run over again every time you hear an increase in COVID cases. God says, be still. I'll fight for you. It's my battle. It's my fight. Be still. Be still. The word believe he says here in, in John 14, 1, he says, you believe in God, believe also in me. When Jesus says believe, this is not a suggestion. This is not even encouragement. But this is a command. He says, no, 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 you need to believe. It is a command. And when it comes to belief, we often think, well, I just need to believe in who Jesus is, what, what he did for me. He came into this earth, he died on a cross, and he arose from the grave, and I have hope in that. And that is true, and you should believe in that. But what Jesus is saying by belief, it's not an historical fact. Just believe this thing that's happened. The Greek word here for belief is pastuo, and pastuo means to trust in. It means to have confidence in. And so when Jesus says to believe in me, he's saying put your trust in me. Put your confidence in who I say that I am. And I am a God who will fight for you. Believe in that. Believe. So believe is the same as trust. And when we are still We allow the belief and the trust to come out. And I want to say this. I want to make sure I say this right. If belief, if trusting in God is what keeps trouble from being troubling, from trouble on the outside, from coming troubling on the inside, then unbelief, a lack of trust, makes trouble especially troubling. Let me say that again. If belief or trust makes trouble less troubling, then unbelief, a lack of trust, makes trouble especially troubling. We wouldn't say it that way, but that's what Jesus is saying here. How you believe in me, where you put your confidence at, where you put your trust at, has the ability to have have peace on the inside, or be unsettled on the inside. So in just a moment, we're gonna see in Exodus 14, we're gonna see the story uh, of the Israelites going through 
uh, you know, they've been freed from captivity. We're gonna see what happens when they have a lack of trust, a lack of faith. But before I get to that, I wanna make a side note that I think is really important. We've been talking about listening to the Holy Spirit, listening to the Holy Spirit. And if we're gonna be honest, the Holy Spirit has kind of a stigma to it. For some people, it's like, I don't know what the Holy Spirit even is. My dad was raised uh, in a church where if he had the Holy Spirit, it was like from the devil. It's not a good thing. People try to avoid. And you have kind of like the charismatic movement and speaking in tongues. People are like, I don't want nothing to do with that kind of spirit. So I just want to spend a few moments talking about the Holy Spirit because when we quiet ourselves, we position ourselves to listen to the Holy Spirit. And I think what I want to say today for some of you has the power to unlock something new in your spiritual life to give you a breakthrough. I want to pick up real quick here in John 14, verse 16. This is still in the last discourse. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. Basically, Jesus is saying, God's going to give you the Holy Spirit. But you know him, for he lives with you, and this is really important, and will be in you, not alongside of you, not around you, but in you. I will not leave you as orphans. What a powerful few verses right here. But for the disciples, they were confused by what Jesus was talking about. What are you talking about, Jesus? Another advocate? What is going on? And if we're going to be honest with ourselves, we can kind of sometimes feel that way about the Holy Spirit. What is the Holy Spirit? How do I know it's the Holy Spirit that's in me? The Greek word, and I apologize for so much Greek today. I'm kind of a Greek nerd today, but I think it's important to share a couple of things about this. The Greek word for spirit, for Holy Spirit, is pneuma. In pneuma, it's in the neuter form. And why is that important? Well, it's not masculine or feminine. And the pronoun that should be attached to pneuma, to spirit, should be it. That should be the pronoun that goes with the neuter noun. But Jesus never says it. He describes the Holy Spirit as he or him. And why does he do that? Because he wants you to see the Holy Spirit as a person, as a person, and I gotta tell you, this is really big for some of you. This is really, like this has the potential to unlock some spiritual power on your journey that you really need. Maybe you have been taught to think as a spirit, as an it, rather than a he. And you relate to him as a what, rather than a who, a force, rather than a friend's and you are missing out on the companionship you are meant to have on this journey. He promises to be in you. When you look at this verse, he says, another advocate. This is the last little bit of Greek, I promise you. I promise you, but it's important. There's two Greek words for another. Heteros, which means similar, but not the same. And the second one is alos, which means exactly the same. So when Jesus says another advocate, which one do you think he's using here? The same. Jesus uses himself and the Holy Spirit interchangeably. To know Jesus Christ is to know the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is meant to be our companion, to be with us through this journey. He is a companion like no other companion. He provides things that no one else can provide. He provides things that my spouse cannot provide. He provides things that your kids or your friends can't provide. The Apostle Paul says something really strange in Ephesians. He says, don't be drunk on wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit." It's an odd juxtaposition. Why is he comparing wine with the Holy Spirit? Well, he says when, when trouble comes, when trouble comes, don't find comfort in drink, in my case, carbs, a pizza, 
brownies, cake. He says, don't find comfort. That's not real comfort. The Holy Spirit provides you with the right kind of comforts. He's the only one that can give you peace that transcends all understanding. He's a friend, a comforter. He's in us. That's why Jesus says it was good for him to go away. It's good for him to go away so that the advocate will be, John 15 says, the vine. If you remain in me, I will remain, not alongside of you, in you. The God of the universe, his spirit is in you. So we come back to Exodus 14, 14, and we see this story of the Israelites and what happens when there's a lack of trust, a lack of belief. Moses has been used by God to free the Israelites from the Egyptians. I mean, they were in captivity for hundreds and hundreds of years, and he is going to challenge the people to be still and believe that God will fight for them. And so he frees them from captivity. And they're on their way out on a journey to the promised land. And then Pharaoh has a change of heart. He, he wants to go back after them again. And he meets up with them at the Red Sea. Then we have this thing, this picture, this image of the Red Sea and the Israelites and the Egyptian army. And they're trapped. The situation is troubling. They are in trouble. And this is how the people re respond to this situation. They are in a troubling situation. They respond by complaining, by criticizing, by being divisive, pointing fingers and being negative. That's what they do in the middle of this. So check this out. Verse 11, Exodus 14. There's so much sarcasm. You can just hear the sarcasm in the Israelites. They said to Moses, was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us to the desert to die? Really, this is what's gonna happen? What have you done to us bringing us out to Egypt? Didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone? No, they didn't. They didn't say that. They wanted to be free. They didn't say, I want to be in captivity for the rest of my life. They wanted to be free. But they're complaining. They're negative. Didn't we say, leave us alone? Nope. It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. They're being very, very sarcastic. They're just hypercritical and complaining and negative and divisive. And I'm telling you, this is what people do in times of trouble when they don't believe when they don't have trust in who God says he is. This is what they do, and this is what is going on a lot these days around us. We see it all around us. Trouble comes, and when there is not belief, you start to see the unbelief surface. Anxiety, depression, people lashing out, lots of frustrations, lots of divisiveness, lots of criticism, and here is what Moses does. Such a great example of what it means to be a leader. When he replies to the people, he doesn't go over their complaint list with them. He said, leave us alone. He didn't say, no, you didn't. He didn't say that. He doesn't argue and debate with them. He's gonna speak faith. He's gonna speak belief and trust and stillness into the people. And so as a church, that's how we're gonna be as well to you guys. I know we live in a time right now and with the months ahead, this is an election year, let's be honest. There's gonna be a lot more opinions, a lot more negativity. Pandemic, I'm not sure when it's gonna end. No idea. Gonna be a lot of criticism. You should just know that when you come here to Restoration Park Church, we're not gonna do that. It's not who we are. We're not going to do that. God fights for us. We're going to be still. Moses is going to speak hope and faith into his people. He's going to say to them, he's saying to us, stop acting like victims. You're not. 
The God who created the world is on your side. Stop acting like you are an underdog in all of this. You're not. The God who spoke the world into existence is the God we put our faith in. Why are we acting like we are defeated and discouraged when we know that victory has already happened at the cross? And so Moses is going to speak this to the people. He's going to remind them, yeah, trouble is here, but don't let it come on the inside. This is how Moses answers in verse 13. Moses answered the people, do not be afraid. Stand firm. Stand firm. And you will see the deliverance of the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You only need to be still. I don't think this is a counseling session with Moses and the Israelites. I think this is more of a halftime pep talk. A football coach whose team has been getting the crap kicked out of him the first half. He's coming in. Stop! He's kicking lockers and knocking over water jugs. Relax! The God who created the universe is on your side. Be still. Look at what Moses is doing. He sees the people freaking out. Lord, we'll fight for you. And Moses speaks this over all of them. Speaks this. I love this scripture. I love Exodus 14, 14. It's a great reminder. When I have counseled, I've used this scripture hundreds of times. People are going through difficult situations. Say, God will fight for you. Just be still. Marriage is, is broken. I said, God will fight for you. Just be still. Stop doing what you're doing. You're making it worse. God will fight for you uncertain of your future, of your job, finances, be still. God's gonna fight for you. Dealing with shame, guilt of your past, and you're still fighting against that. God says, stop. It's a fight that I've already won. Be still. Be still. He says, be still. Church, we're fighting battles that we're never meant to fight. And I have declared this verse so many times. And I've never really looked at the next verse. I've read through it. Never looked at the next verse. Look at verse 15. After Moses just says to the people, the Lord will fight for you. You only need to be still. Then the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Keep moving. Moses says, be still. God says, keep moving. And the Israelites are going like, hello, God. Uh, There's a thing called the Red Sea in front of us, and behind us is the Egyptian army. What are you talking about? What are you talking about here, God? Keep moving. And what I I think is happening here, and and I love this. This is what belief does for us. It allows us to be still without being stopped. Let me say that again. What belief, what trust does, it allows us to be still and not be stopped. Belief allows us to be still in our spirit while we continue to move forward with our feet. And I don't know about you, but it's a message I need to hear in this season. It's not be still or move forward, it's be still and move forward. Trusting in the one who was fighting for me. Being still, knowing that he's the one that's working. The best thing that we can do when there are troubles is turn and face what God is saying to the Israelites. Be still, keep moving, face your troubles, face the Red Sea. God won't take you away from the troubles, but he will help you get through it. And for the Israelites, the Red Sea parted. They went through. And then the Egyptian army was swallowed up by the the sea. I want to tell you that 
by facing the Red Sea today, that God's going to part the seas for you today. I want to say that. And for some of you, maybe that's what's happening now today. You're going to have a breakthrough. You're going to turn. And God, this is your fight. I'm just going to be still and move forward, trusting in who you are. And he might part the seas for you today. But he might not. And even if he doesn't, God says, be still and move forward. Because when we turn and we face the troubles that are ahead of us, God does something in us. He does something in us. He molds us. And he shapes us. Our best response to when storms happen is not to run away from it, but it's to face it. Jesus allowed his disciples to go through a storm so they could see that the one who was greater than the storms was with them. Church, can I tell you that the one who is greater than the storms is with you and he is in you. What a powerful imagery. What a powerful thing to know that the God of the universe is in us. So what Moses does to his people is a commitment that we have as pastors to you. Church, we're not going to be a freak out people. We're going to speak faith and hope and trust into you. We're not going to be the freak out people. We're not going to act like we don't have confidence. We aren't going to act like we don't have hope when we have the hope of the world. We aren't going to act like we don't know the way when we know the way. And we aren't going to act like we don't have light in the darkness when we know the light. That's why we put our faith in Jesus, the one who fights for us. In just a moment, we're going to call Ethan out here to do communion. I want to say a couple things to close to you. Starting next week, we're going to be doing a prayer challenge. We want you to, to be with us, to join us. We challenge you to be a part of that with us. It's not some magical formula but it's learning how to position yourself, to quiet yourself down, to learn how to listen to the Holy Spirit that is in you and to respond to it. This has the potential to give you peace that transcends all understanding, strength and comfort to get through whatever the world throws at you. So I want to encourage you to be a part of that with us. And this is when I have a, I want to close with you guys. I recognize fighting the battles is hard, is hard to let go of that and let God to be God in that. I'm so guilty of taking the fight into my own hands. Being still is really hard. In John 9, Jesus heals the man born blind. And later on, he sees that same guy again. He goes, do you believe? And the guy says, I believe Help me with my unbelief. I don't know about you, but that's me. Jesus, I believe. Jesus, I trust. Help me with my unbelief and my lack of trust at times. So continue to find a place to quiet yourselves down. Remove all the distractions. Turn off your phones. Get away from your kids for a few minutes if you can. Find a quiet place. And say these things. Lord, help me with my unbelief. I believe you. I trust you. Lord, I know this is your fight. I know I'm to be still and know that you are God. Lord, help me with that. And allow God to work with his spirit through you. And I promise you he will if you're open to that. So, Father God, I thank you that you are the God of the universe. That you created the heavens and the earth and yet you want to speak to every single one of us. You want to be in a relationship. You want to be engaged intimately with each and every one of us. And Lord, you say that all we have to do is be still and focus our mind on you and you will do your work. Lord, I admit that it's so hard to do that. The flesh in me wants to take control. 
The world around me wants to continue to distract me, but Lord, I pray that you would help us to slow down, take a deep breath, focus on you, and know that you are God. Know that you are fighting for us. So Lord, we thank you. We praise you right now. In Christ's name, amen.